Welcome to episode 63 of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast, or GFP, a Toronto Maple Leafs and NHL podcast hosted by Michael Lapore and Anthony Bruno. He's Lapore. I'm Bruno. Thank you so much for listening and watching us on YouTube as well. If you're a new listener and you really enjoy the show, it would be a big time help if you give us a five-star rating and review on both Apple and Spotify. And if you're watching us on YouTube and you like what you see, then we would appreciate it so, so much if you smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell so you know exactly when the GFP podcast is posting some new content. All right, everybody. As of Tuesday, June 7th, 2022, the Edmonton Oilers have done it again, getting swept out of the playoffs for the second straight season, going down in four straight to the Colorado Avalanche, just when it looked like Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl were going to lead this team to glory after their triumphant victory over the Calgary Flames in the Battle of Alberta. The Oilers go out in four straight to the juggernaut Colorado Avalanche. We have a lot to talk about on this podcast. It's going to be a lot of fun. Oilers versus Avalanche, Lightning versus Rangers, Con Smythe talk. Stanley Cup talk. We are going to give you our thoughts and opinions on all of that. But before we do, it is time to welcome in my partner in crime, Mr. Michael Lapore. How you doing, man? Anthony Bruno is pumped up at the elimination of the Edmonton Oilers. I'm sure he's very excited uh, for this podcast. But it's a terrible day, Anthony Bruno. It's raining outside. My back is out as I'm coming to realize that I'm becoming an old man and it sucks. Sitting in this chair right now is absolutely excruciating. Episode 63, shout out goes to a player who holds a special place in my heart, Tyler Ennis. And I'll tell you why Ennis holds a special place in my heart. When he was trying, I believe he was on a PTO initially with uh, that one year he played for the Leafs. He played an exhibition game against the Sens. I took my nephew to see our beloved Leafs. Ennis was third star of the game. And because there were so many Leafs fans in Ottawa, he came out, he did his twirl, and he tossed my nephew an autograph puck. So wherever Tyler Ennis is right now, shout out, bud. Thanks. Uh, my nephew will always be grateful for the puck. That is an awesome Tyler Ennis story. And honestly, Lepore, I think a lot of Leaf fans are right there with you with Tyler Ennis because... You know, he was a fourth liner, but he was a pretty effective fourth liner for the Leafs. And not just the Leafs, like he's been an effective player throughout his career. So shout out Tyler Ennis and Lapore. I hope you're able to get through this podcast with that back. Yeah, uh, that back situation, man. I'm I'm almost as injured as Dreisaitl, but we'll we'll see what I can do (laughs) getting through here. Going through this podcast is almost as difficult as uh, trying to blast uh, past Kale McCarr. Just grind it out, Lapore. (laughs) Yeah, grind it out. If you need to take a break. For, uh, for a few minutes, just let me know. But I, for I have some faith. stretching in Advil or, <laughs> but I have some, I have faith you're going to get through the next hour. So <clears throat> let's do this, man. Let's jump right into this Can't Oilers wait. versus Avalanche. A lot of you, if you've been listening to this podcast over the last couple of years, you know how I feel about the Edmonton Oilers. And where it starts for me is the expectations I have for this team based on Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. You have these two supernova talents at the peak of their powers. A team that, if it was built correctly, should arguably be a shoe in for the Stanley Cup. Like, when have we ever seen this before? Two talents like this. Like, go back to Crosby and Malkin. You know, even Taves and Kane, who aren't on the same level as Crosby and Malkin or McDavid and Dreisaitl. Like, When have those teams ever struggled this much? When have those teams built around, you know, two cornerstone franchise players like that? And sure, you can make fun of the Leafs all you want. The Leafs haven't accomplished anything, okay? And even Matthews and Marner aren't on the same level as a duo when you compare them to McDavid and Dreisaitl. This team just continues to struggle come playoff time. And sure, they made it to the conference finals, but when you have... Like I said, two supernova talents on your roster, and you're getting swept for the second straight season, despite those two generational players having the postseason of a lifetime. You got a lot of problems there. And sure, you can clap your hands 
and say, great job, Edmonton. Conference finals. You made it further than any other Canadian team. Let's go hang a banner in Rogers Place in Edmonton. But my goodness, man, I think a lot of people are are not really telling it like it is right now with this Oilers team, and everyone's patting them on the back for a job well done. They took the next step, quote unquote. But I still think there's a lot of issues with this team, Lapore. Like you just you you just cannot get swept in this situation with the Avs missing Darcy Kemper, Nazem Kadri, who missed half the series after he got injured in Game Three after playing 37 seconds. And the Avalanche were also without Sam Girard. Yeah. And this Oilers team still got swept out of the playoffs. Yeah, it's, you can look at it different ways because, uh, yeah, they did get swept. But if I remember correctly, there were two one-goal games and one game that was a one-goal game up until late. I mean, props to the Oilers for making the conference finals. I think I'm in the boat, and I'm sure deep down, Bruno, you're in this boat with the Edmonton Oilers, is you see these two players. And how good they are. Facts are facts. Look at the numbers they put up. And you look at the team that's built around them. And it's not necessarily an awful team, but there's things that jump out black and white with certain teams that on the conversation of can this team win a Stanley Cup, you can easily say yes, or you can easily say no. And I think with the Oilers, to jump out for me, the Edmonton Oilers were not, were not going to win the Stanley Cup with Mike Smith as their goalie. Yeah, no Period. chance. I, they brought up that stat. I don't know if you saw it about his game ones in Edmonton. He's like 0-5. He's been pulled in three of them. His save percentage is like in, in, in the low 800s. And again, I'm not saying they lost because of Mike Smith or he was just brutal in this series. Goaltending is important, as everyone knows. And you're not going to win the cup. Doesn't mean you can't be a good team. Doesn't mean you can't go on a run with Mike Smith, but you're not going to win the whole thing with him. The next is I look at the D. An Bingo. old Duncan Keith, Cody CC. Sorry, guys. Like, it's not going to happen. Nur- nurse came out. Like, Nurse had a bad playoffs, I thought, but it came out he was injured. It's his hip, right? So that's absolutely brutal. It's just you, you look at that decor and they're not going to win the Stanley Cup. You look across the ice and you see Kale McCarr. You see Taves, Bowen Byram. Like, guys, like it's, it's, it's too much of a mismatch, to be fair. Now, the Oilers have a good forward group, and I think they even have some guys who are underrated. But it, it's not even about this playoffs. It's not about this run. It's just about how the team's been built. And that's where I think the, fa- the failure has to be circled. It's the opportunity that's been given to this franchise with these two players. Or I, should, I, should, I shouldn't say given the opportunity that this franchise has come across and their lack of ability to take advantage of it. And Oilers fans out there, you can't come on guys. Like you can't say you're allowed to be proud of your team. You made a conference final. Fuck. I haven't seen my team in the, in the conference finals in a long time. And you're allowed to clap your hands, but from the perspective of winning the whole thing, beating a team like Colorado over seven games. No, like it's They're still light years away from. Yeah. That. Like it, there's huge gaps and we'd have to go over the cap friendly sheet to see where they sit with some of their contracts and length. I know some of them are bad, but if they can get, get out of some holes, we'll see what Ken Holland can do in the off season. But to me, it's, it's twofold with the Oilers. I mean, I've always kind of I say cheered for the Oilers, but yeah, like I was rooted for the Oilers a little bit being a Canadian team the whole Gretzky connection. I love Gretzky growing up. So yeah, props to the Oilers, go Oilers. So I'm happy they did well. I'm happy they made the conference final. But at the same time, I don't really see anything getting any better and then being able to get to that next step unless serious changes are made. Serious changes are made to that to that lineup. That's really well said, Lepore. And I'm honestly right there in the same camp as you because a lot of people think I hate on the Oilers. You know, you're a salty Leafs fan. Shut your mouth. You just can't stand Edmonton and their success. It's not that at all. You, you don't think I want to see Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl on the biggest stage in hockey? These two guys are unbelievable. They combined for 65 points in 16 playoff games. Think about that for a second. <laughs> 65 points in 16 playoff games, and it still wasn't enough. This team, at the end of the postseason, finished 500 at 8-8. Eight and eight. 
an eight and eight record with Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl putting up 65 points in 16 games. With me, it's exactly what Lapore said. You have an opportunity here to build a really quality team around these two talents, and they have just failed to get it done year after year. They've missed the playoffs three times in McDavid's seven seasons. And sure, pat your team on the back for getting to the conference finals. It's a great accomplishment. But the way that they went out to the avalanche and just seeing the talent discrepancy, especially on the blue line, and especially just even, even the forward depth, like when you compare Colorado's bottom six and what they were able to do on both sides of the puck compared to Edmonton's bottom six forward group, the Oilers just have a lot of work to do. And, and what I'm looking at, Lepore, is this whole postseason run as a whole. So think about it. Go back to the first round for the Oilers. They face a Los Angeles Kings team missing Drew Doughty and Victor Arvidsson. Okay, Victor Arvidsson was one of their top three goal scorers this year. This is also a Kings team that had no star players on its roster. Okay, this, this isn't the 2012 LA Kings with like prime Andre Kopitar and prime Drew Doughty. Okay, yeah. this was arguably the worst team of all 16 teams that made the playoffs. Edmonton was down 3 2 to this team, Lapore. They barely got past this team in the first round. That would have been a colossal failure. It would have been very, very close, if not worse, than the Leafs losing to the Habs <laughs> in the first round last season. Uh, close. Honestly, like, you know, people can agree or disagree with me, but I think you put those right in the same bucket if Edmonton had found a way to lose to that Kings team in the first round. So they, they get through the first round, good for them. Then in the second round, I will give them credit. They dominated the Flames that entire series, you know, despite that insanely crazy game one that finished, what was it, 9-6? Yeah, yeah that was just a, a shit show. But after that, they dominated the Flames. But saying that, Jacob Markstrom was awful. Matthew Kachuk had a terrible series. Calgary just, quite frankly, didn't show up. They did not show up. In the no. final four games. But again, let's give them credit. Like Kane and Hyman also had... Really Amazing. good second round series and, and good playoffs in general. Kane and Hyman scored a ton of goals. Okay. They combined for, let me look at the final numbers here. I believe they combined for 21 goals. Sorry, 24 goals. Evander Kane and Zach Hyman combined for 24 goals in this playoff run. Unbelievable from those two guys. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then we get into the conference final. And like I said, no Darcy Kemper. Kadri plays half the series. No Sam Gerrard. And you get swept. It's just unacceptable, Laporte. You Dude, Tyson Berry like that. Tyson Berry, you know their puck moving, scoring defenseman, was scoreless in his first three games of the series. Then had one assist last night, and he was playing like twenty minutes a game, man. Yeah, and he and he gets all the power play time. I know they yeah, they switch like him and Evan Bouchard, you know, kind of depending on the situation. I yeah, I think dry Bouchard Sider plays high sometimes, and yeah. yeah, like I think Bouchard is like their actual best power play quarterback but Barry still does get a lot of time on the power play and yeah for him to to just not put up any points until yeah. until game four that's disappointing you know that's another part of their blue line it's like are you really going to win a stanley cup with cody cc duncan keith and tyson barry on your blue line and, and i mean i, I know mean, yeah, darnell answer. nurse like i get it. it's a terrible injury but oilers fans were also shitting on darnell nurse for his lack yeah. of effectiveness throughout the playoffs. We'll, we'll, let, making... we'll let him we'll let him off the hook because of a hip injury. Yeah, yeah. Be, and, and I've been through a hip injury, so I'll be the first person to uh to give him a thumbs up for what he accomplished playing with a bad hip. Yeah, and but Lapore, he's he's gonna be making nine and a quarter million dollars. Mm. I believe starting next season, that contract kicks in. So yeah, man, this roster just needs a lot of work. And you said it with Mike Smith. Like, do you really think you're gonna win a Stanley Cup? with Mike Smith as your goaltender. And if you look at his overall numbers for the playoffs, they were actually pretty good. His save percentage in the playoffs, 913. Okay, sure. like not, not bad at all, but it's the timely, it's the timely goals the that gaffes. he's letting in. Yeah, It's those stupid gaffes that he's making, the soft goals that he's letting in at the worst possible time, just when Edmonton is dying for a save. Look at game three. 2-2, two, two, they're on the power play, and JT Comfer squeaks one through Mike Smith. Good night. That was the series right there. So just, just yeah. a lot of issues across the board. And, you know, I'll say it one more time. Sure, 
congratulate your Edmonton Oilers on making it as far as they did. But you also have to take a step back and realize that this team still has a lot of issues with the way that it's built. And for them to actually take the next step, get to the next level and get to a cup final and win a Stanley cup. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. It's time for a quick break because Father's Day is just around the corner and our friends at Manscaped are here to ensure all the father figures out there are looking daddy material this June. Let's Manscaped's go. Performance Package 4.0, which includes their signature Lawnmower 4.0, is the perfect bundle to tackle any hair from head to toe. This right here is no dad joke. Treat him and yourself and join the 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer, you get 20% off and free shipping with the promo code GFP20 at manscaped.com. Lapore, these products are simply the best, man. They are the best, Anthony Bruno. To everyone listening out there, don't be lame. Don't get your dad a hammer. Don't get him a baseball glove. Get him some Manscaped products. The Lawnmower 4.0, he'll absolutely love it. His balls will be cleaner than ever before, and he will love you for it. So head over to manscaped.com. As Bruno said, GFB 20 for free shipping and 20% off. You said it, Lapore. Get your father what he deserves. <laughs> yes. All right? He deserves these amazing products from Manscaped. I promise you he will be happy when he opens up that gift on Father's Day. All right, so get 20% off and free shipping with the promo code GFP20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com using the promo code GFP20. Shake what your mama gave you? No, shake what your daddy gave you. Nice. Okay, I'm, I'll run through some names on the Oilers roster. You tell me if they're back next season. Okay. Mike Smith. Mike Smith. I know he signed, oh but goodness. did they try to do something there? I think you got to move on from Smith, don't you? Or at least try to. I think they you try gotta to. You got to try. Someone brought up Campbell. For, someone brought up Campbell for them. I've seen that as well. I'm like, that'd be pretty funny because, of course, he'd blame Can me. you imagine? <laughs> yeah, just, you know. Back to back off seasons, the Oilers get Zach Hyman and Jack Campbell. <laughs> just the most lovable players in the history of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Unbelievable. But I think. If you bring Mike Smith back, I think the fan base might might revolt. Really? Well, I don't know. You tell me. You're more dialed. You're more dialed into that stuff with like fan bases and all that. Like, uh, is there like hatred towards Smith from Oilers fans? I'm or telling like... you, man. Oilers fans do not like Mike Smith. You know what Smith is, and it, it's kind of hard to describe. He's kind of annoying. Just like like how he is in the net, like how he exaggerates, like his body language, like when he makes a mistake or when he's upset. Like goalies are supposed to be the opposite. Give me Carey Price. I remember last year watching; they had the camera on him when uh, when Akakanyemi scored the winning goal against Toronto to push it to seven. Like Price didn't flinch. Like he just like grabbed his water bottle and skated off. So in a calm bad, and cool. Yeah, and collected. lets in a bad goal, just like picks the puck out of the net, like he got a shot roofed on him like uh, from Connor McDavid, same thing to him. So I don't know. I just find him kind of annoying and a little too much. I mean, I respect the guy. He's been in the league a long time. He's had a good career. I and mean, the fact that he's even still playing at his age is impressive. I just, I don't know, but I, I didn't, I didn't know Oilers fans. I mean, they just made the conference finals were like out pitchforks for Mike Smith or comment down below Oilers fans. What do you think about Mike Smith? Move on, keep them, throw them to the wolves. What do you do? Yeah. I'm confident in saying the majority of Oilers fans are, are sick of Mike Smith and are frustrated, honestly, because the same thing keeps happening with this guy. You go back to the first round against LA when he made that, that stick handling gaff, <sighs> coughs up the puck, led to a goal. The Oilers ended up losing that game. I can't remember exactly which game it was, but you know they were down 3-2 in that series to arguably the worst team of all 16 teams in the playoffs and barely got out of that round. And honestly, it was because of Connor McDavid. Like he put the team on his back those last couple of games, especially in game seven. Like if he doesn't do that, Edmonton's probably out in the first round. So, yeah. you know, we can go up and down this roster and talk about some of the moves that need to be made. And I know you're going to bring up some other names to me on this Oilers team, but yeah, yeah, with Mike Smith Lapore, I, I just I I can't imagine that team wants to bring him back. And again, I know he has one year left on his deal. How about this? If you bring him back as the backup, I think that's sort of acceptable, but you can't go into another season with Mike Smith 
as your starting goalie. You just can't. What's he making? Like two and change, something like that. I mean, that's yeah, an expensive I have their cap backup. Sheet open here. He's making two point two. Yeah, so I mean, that's an expensive backup. Interesting to see what they do. I mean, it's kind of similar to the Leafs, right? Like develop a goalie. Be amazing if you developed a goalie. The next player I'll move on to. I think this is a hot topic. And again, Oilers fans, comment down below. I want to hear what you have to say. Evander Kane. I am definitely trying to bring back Evander Kane. Yeah. I mean, they're going to try. I just, yeah. Like yeah. he, I think he's a great player. And I said it at the time, despite all the baggage, all the shit that he was involved with throughout his career. And there's a lot of baggage there with that guy. But I said it at the time. I thought it was a great move for the Edmonton Oilers because amazing. Yeah. Because Nothing they were on the verge of missing the playoffs. And I believe at the time they signed Kane, they actually may have been sitting outside of a playoff spot. You might be right. Yeah. It was either they were outside by, you know, by a few points or just barely hanging on to a wild card spot at the time. But I said it. I, I go, this guy's going to light it up, whether he's playing with McDavid or Dry And he was fantastic for them. You know, going over his numbers again, 13 goals and 17 points in 15 playoff games. And then in the regular season, he was also fantastic. Yeah, he's amazing, bro. He's a great player. And again, 22 a great goals, season. 39 points in 43 games. 39 points in 43 games. But then that, that, that worry, it, it worries me too because I, how, like, my line, it only takes one stupid team. And, like, I don't know. Like, if someone said to me, and I think in his case, like, when you talk about players and contracts, of course, there is the money and the money is a big part of it. And it's shrinking as we move forward. But the importance of, you know, the roster they're going into, the timing, the organization. If someone said to me, as far as Evander Kane goes and the situations he's dealt with, that it's all about money, I'd be like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised at all. So, like, I don't even know myself what number and term I'd be shocked with. Like, if someone offered him five times five, would you be shocked? No, not at all. So then keep going six times six? Like, I, I think someone, because if you look at Kane's last contract, let me pull up his last contract. What was like he six times here? Six times six, six, six point five it or was, something. Uh, six years, five and a quarter million per. Oh, that Actually, low. Okay. Sorry, no, that, that's wrong. That was, his, that was his second last contract. Lepore, he's coming off a seven-year, $49 million deal. So seven million a year. Yeah. Okay. A seven times seven. The big thing and, is term, I guess. Like yeah, how much yeah. term would it, is a team willing to give them based on the baggage, like you said? Yeah, it, it's definitely the term, right? Because I think that's what's going to scare teams off. Like, you know, do you really want to commit five plus years to a guy in his 30s who has that much baggage despite what he just pulled off with the Edmonton Oilers? That's a scary yeah. situation. So I, I think he's gonna he's gonna seek. Honestly, Lepore, I think he's going to seek minimum seven million. I really do. Seven, based on his last contract with San Jose, I, I think Kane strikes me as the guy, and I could be totally wrong. Where this dude is just going to—he's going to chase the bag. He kind of has to, based on what yeah. happened. Like, I mean, have like having money problems, and I'm like, I, I wouldn't blame him. Like, hey, yeah. dude, you got to do whatever you got to do. Like, who's yeah. ever offer whoever offers him the most term, the most money? I think that's where he's going. Honestly, yeah. it's simple as that. Maybe, you know, maybe it's a case where he says, I'm in a great situation playing with Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. Let's run this back. Let me sign a two-year deal, you know, for $14 million or something like that. But, I, I, but man, if, if Edmonton commits to him long-term, I don't know. That's a scary situation. But I, I would love to have him back. I, I really would. I, just, I would just tread very carefully with that situation. Yeah. The other one I'll throw out there, and it's not really a guy specifically, is game one of next season, will we see a major change to their D? Will one of those, a nurse isn't going anywhere, obviously, like the other three, is there a chance any of them are moved? I mean, CC just signed as well. I mean, Keith, was, Keith and Barry were acquired not that long ago. So is there any chance like their D, they make a move to make their D better? That's a great question because, as you said, Nurse isn't going anywhere. It's He's sticky. locked in for nine and a quarter million. Duncan Keith still has a year left on his deal at five point five million. Tyson Berry two years left at four point five million, and then Cody CC three years left at three and a quarter million. So, what I want to see with this Oilers blue line is I want to see Evan Bouchard essentially just take over 
And, you know, maybe it's a little too soon to have him be like the go-to guy, especially when you're paying Darnell Nurse over $9 million a year. But I want to see a lot of minutes for Evan Bouchard. And I I do think they're going to try to make some moves. Like, they could easily try to trade Tyson Berry to let Evan Bouchard become like the go-to, no questions about it, power play quarterback, you're our offensive defenseman, you know, go and run with it. Whereas having Tyson Berry there, it's almost like the situation with like Morgan Riley and Tyson Berry on the Leafs, how it's like they were trying to coexist and they kind of play a similar game. So awful. (laughs) That was so awful. Yeah. So I I think if maybe they try to move Tyson Berry again, I have no insider knowledge on this. It's not like I've talked to, you know, people in the Edmonton Oilers organization, but I I would imagine that they maybe try to move him. I mean, Duncan Keith, who the hell is going to take Duncan Keith? Yeah, such a weird, weird deal. He is on an expiring deal, though. So maybe how that many, helps the situation. I don't know. Maybe how many can, years? How many years left? Only only one year. Just the one year. Just left, the one yeah. at five point five. As terrible okay. as that cap hit is, maybe they can dump him and attach a draft pick to him or something to clear up some cap space. And yeah, what we're seeing in the league with teams trying to get to the floor and all that, like you never know. But again. They just acquired them. But I'm going to throw this one out there because this is a Leafs podcast and, you know, we like to get chairs and shit and everything okay. thrown at us. So McDavid, Dreisaitl, and Nurse, you're in around $30 million. Okay, $30 million. Matthews, Marner, Riley, you're in around $30 million. Which trio would you rather have? That's a great question. I will say that I'll take the Edmonton trio just because of the duo of McDavid and Dreisaitl. But that nurse contract, I said it at the time, Lepore, I'm pretty sure you had, you know, very similar thoughts to me when that contract was first announced. That's a bad deal. It's the highest paid defenseman in the league. (laughs) That is just absurd that he's making nine and a quarter million. He's a good player. Again, like Darnell Nurse, fully healthy, you know, no, yeah, you had him on your team Canada, right? I remember we did yeah. that episode. Yeah, I did have him as as one of my depth guys on team. Canada. I had him and Morgan Riley. Yeah, me too. Uh, I don't think I had Nurse, but I had Riley. Yeah, when we made those teams back when the uh, Olympics were supposed to happen, where when NHL players were supposed to go to the Olympics. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I think just because of that that Nurse contract, it, it almost made me want to flip over to the Leaf side of it. That makes it a debate because the whole thing of like that two million. It's like a McDavid dry settle versus Matthews Marner. Like it's close, but I think most people would say go on the Edmonton side. Yeah. But then you throw in that 1.75 million difference or whatever it is. Like, well, that makes it closer. But like, I, I think Riley's a better player than Darnell Nurse. I think most people would say that outside the state. Outside, I almost said outside of Alberta, but I'm sure Flames fans be quick to shit on their Nurse. Yeah, it's that's that's a tough contract, but but I will go with the Edmonton trio just because of McDavid and Dreisaitl and especially Dreisaitl, the contract he's on now, it's arguably the best contract in hockey. Oh yeah. Maybe yeah. outside of McKinnon who still makes like 6.3 million, which is insane. Yeah. Or Pasternax is bananas too. But yeah, that's uh, I, I would definitely take that trio. Are there any other names you want to throw at me or was that it? Who else can you really say? Like Nugent Hopkins is signed. Like they've guys that, like they've guys that, like Hyman just signed. Like I like Yamamoto. Like I don't know. I think as far as I think as far as far as the forward group goes, minus Kane, it's pretty it's pretty steady. Like we know what it's going to be and what the future is going to look like. But I mean, talking points. Be interesting to see where uh, how they approach the Kane situation and where he ends up. And I'd like to see him stay there. Like let's do it. Like l- let's oh, watch yeah. the, again again rooting for the Oilers. <laughs> so like I'd love to see him stay and he was a great fit. And w- these situations are so funny cuz like here we are pushing for the money, the money, the money, the money, but at the same time you hope and maybe I'm giving too much credit here that he's got some self-awareness and his agent has some awareness that okay, there is the money, but there's also Who's going to, I don't know what better way to put this, but who's going to keep him on his best behavior. And I know that sounds super demeaning, but stuff has happened with this guy. There's been issues with this guy, both on and off the ice. I mean, by that, I mean, with his teams. So if he's in a good situation in Edmonton where he's protected, he likes the guys he's playing with. You hear me say a million times that like guys do well when they're happy. 
he looks happy in Edmonton. So if it costs you a little bit of money to be happy and play well and play with good players, hopefully he takes it, man. Like I'm rooting for that deal to get done. If I had to yeah. bet, we'll, we'll, we'll do that game. What's the, what's the pie chart of Kane in Edmonton? I'd say it's pretty low. I'd say like 25, 30%. He's back as an oiler. Really? Eh? I, I was yeah, going to say I think it's... someone's going to do something stupid. I think someone's going to give him like an eight times four or something. He's going to get big bit. Like he's going to get overpaid is, is what I'm fearing. I'll still One put it at 50, team, 50, yeah. just because I would like to believe he understands the situation that he's in right now, playing with those players in that top six. And how, and you know, I, I hope that he sees like how much success he just had in the playoffs and in the regular season. And again, this is a dude that was the leading scorer for the San Jose Sharks in his final year with the Sharks as well. So I think Kane can put up numbers, you know, pretty much anywhere as long as he's playing with with good players. But it's not very often you get an opportunity to play with two generational talents. Yeah. It's, it's funny just, though, right? it, it, it's a matter of if he goes to chase the money or not. That's what this is going to come down to. Like, here we are. It's going to be, I'm sure Edmonton wants him back. It's going to be about dollars. And we're in a cap world. Everyone deals with this. You just mentioned that Keith contract. Like, that could cost them Kane. Yeah. That sucks. Like, that sucks. Like, he, like I mean, I can't say, we can't say, well, if they'd Keith it less money because they traded for him, but that's what costs you in the cap league, man. It's a tough situation because they they need a goalie as well. Like Nico Koskinen is now an unrestricted free agent, and I can't imagine that he's going to be back. So no. they, they do have some money, but like <laughs> you got to sign a goalie. You have all this money now locked up in Darnell Nurse. Uh, another guy I'd like to see them bring back on the blue line is even Brett Kulak, who's an unrestricted okay. free agent. I thought That's he was pretty player. solid for them. Agreed. But like, yeah, they they got holes to fill. But it's not going to be that easy because a lot of their guys are locked in and they don't have a ton of a ton of flexibility. Yeah, we have to look to see if anything's coming in. Like I don't know. I'm I can't I'm not gonna lie and say I'm familiar with the uh, prospect chart, but they do have Dylan Holloway who they inserted into the lineup in a desperation move in game four. Mm. And and I don't blame them. They're down three nothing in the series, they needed a spark. Kane was suspended. So Dylan Holloway, first round pick, you know, maybe he plays a factor next season. I don't know how big of a factor he's actually going to play. They have Stuart Skinner in net, who we saw in the regular season, was pretty solid for Edmonton. You know, and then even some other guys on the blue line as well, like Philip Broberg, who a lot of Oilers fans viewed in the same light as Evan Bouchard. He hasn't, okay. you know, been as quick. He hasn't, he hasn't made an impact as quickly as Bouchard has, but you know, he's also a former first round pick. So they got some, they got some guys in the pipeline, but still a lot of work to be done. Lepore. Let's move on, man. Yeah. We, we've Let's talked about, on. we've talked about the Oilers long enough. Their fans probably, well, their, their fans always hate on us and I'm sure they want to punch a hole. Hey, you in more me. than me, you more than me. That's oh, for Oilers sure. Oilers fans can't stand me. Can it's Canadians fans who hate me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Habs fans hate me too. I mean, yeah, but Habs fans kind of hate everyone. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, good point. But yeah, Edmonton, uh, good luck. Good luck in the offseason. I'm sure we'll have a lot more to talk about um, when Ken Holland decides to uh, to make his first move of the offseason. We're going to fire up the sure. podcast. And, I'm sure Kenny's pumped. But we'll see what happens there. Now let's move on, Lapore, to the Lightning and Rangers. Yeah. What a All series. Right. This has been an interesting series because it looked like the Rangers were going to go up three, nothing. Like it was looking real scary for the back-to-back champs in that game three, but the lightning do what the Tampa Bay lightning have been doing for the last two years. Just when you Fucking think they're annoying. down and out, that team always finds a way to win. They win game three. The series is two, one. Now it's almost like a pick them at this point despite the Rangers being up 2-1, like looking at the betting odds right now. So the Rangers are minus 140, Lightning plus 120, so not exactly a pick them. But with home ice advantage, yeah. I mean, that makes sense. They're they're essentially saying it's a pick them, but one team has home ice. Yeah. You know, but it it does feel like a coin flip, honestly, at this point with this Tampa team, even though they're down 2-1, like winning that game three and having that, that championship pedigree and the heart of a champion, man, you just can never count this team out. 
Yeah. I often like, it, it's fun to look back at teams that have won Stanley cups and the runs they went on the teams, they played the games they went through and you can always find specific moments that like something got turned around, like they were done they were done. And then they got a bounce or, and like you, you look at Tampa, man, game six at home against the Leafs here, they were losing like the, again, going back to the second, I was going to say in, uh, in the third period, in the second period, think of the momentum, the momentum swing of those three Toronto goals. Like that game's, I don't say that game's over, but like it did not look good for Tampa, how Toronto grabbed that momentum, winning game five the way they did. And then in game six, scoring three straight, the third uh, third goal right there in the second period to have the lead going into the third and cruising. And they get that five on three. So you can look back and say, you know, if Tampa is to win the Stanley Cup, wow, like that five on three in game six was everything. And now they got another one from the Rangers. Rangers up two nothing on the road in Tampa, about to go up three nothing, and Tampa pulls it out. Unbelievable! Like they they refuse to die, and it's something. I mean, I'm in awe about, but it's crazy, man. It's one of those weird things. Like it's got to get in teams' heads. If you're the Rangers, right? If you're the Rangers right now, you're afraid that you that you poke the bear that you allowed them getting to get back in the series. Because one thing's for sure. I mean, you can you often see teams get up in a series and they got to take their foot off the gas. The Rangers did not because they know you can't let Tampa back in the series. Even two, I think we talked about it on the last show. If Tampa goes down three to one, no one's going to be like Tampa's done. No, no way. No. Like I, I think we've seen from this series is, and even from the Leaf series, even though Leafs lost speed, you can beat the lightning with speed. Like the Leafs were able to, you know, get uh, put their, put themselves in good situations because of their speed and their uh, forward depth. And you're seeing it with the Rangers. A lot of guys who can move their feet and t- they have Tampa running around sometimes. So be fun to see. I mean, like like how this is going to uh, how this is going to uh, finish. I'm, like right now, what's your gut telling you? Because if someone asked me, like I really don't know. I picked the Lightning in six games before the series. Now I think if the lightning do win this series, it's, it's more likely than not going to be in seven games. I'm going to stick with my lightning pick, but man, this Rangers team Lapore. And it's funny because we were joking about this on the last show. I picked the Rangers to beat Pittsburgh. I picked the Rangers to beat Carolina in the second round. And then I jumped off the Rangers bandwagon in this round. Cause I just couldn't bet against the lightning. And it was you who had the, the Rangers moving on. And I was like, beating myself up when they went up to nothing. I'm like, Oh my God, you should have just stuck with the Rangers. You should have, you should have stayed on that ride. Like I did in the first two rounds, but I'm still, I'm still going to go with the lightning. I was the opposite. I picked them to lose the first two. I'm like, I thought the penguins were going to beat them. And then I thought Carolina was going to beat them. And now I'm like, Oh, they've convinced me. I'm going to pick them. Hilarious how that ended up playing out, but I'm going to stick with the lightning, but I am concerned Lapore because this Rangers team they they're looking really good and and it does appear that they're still probably going to get the job done up two to one but like i said i'm never counting out tampa and i'm going to stick with the lightning how about you if i gotta pick one the rangers have some mojo right now man and the the thing with tampa we hear oh they've been through two full playoffs those injuries are piling up they're getting tired we're seeing uh bits of vasilevsky look human I don't know. I, I just, I'm like 60, 40 Rangers. And I mean, that says a lot for Tampa considering they're down two to one in the series. And like, I hate to play this game, but it's fun. If you're Colorado, who would you rather face? Oh, that's a really good question. Nice one, man. Huh? Honestly, I think at this point I'd probably rather face Tampa and yeah, the agree. simple reason is just injuries. Yeah. Like if Braden point is not going to be a hundred percent, that's huge for Colorado, especially if, if Kadri is going to be out for the rest of the playoffs, which right now it looks like he isn't going to come back. Like that, that would mean that Colorado is down their number two center in Kadri and the lightning are also down there. I mean, he really Braden points their number one center, but he's obviously one of their top two centermen. So I, I honestly, I think Colorado would rather face a banged up lightning team at this point. Yeah, I think I'd agree. I think I'd agree. And like, I was just touching on with the Rangers and their speed, the Rangers can, the Rangers can skate with Colorado. So 
Imagine Fox versus Makar. That's oh, amazing. That would be unreal. That's, that, that's a great story. And again, like Shesterkin too. I mean, Rangers, weird team, eh? Weird team. Like no one took them seriously all year. And again, they haven't done anything yet, but they've gotten, it's, it's kind of like they, they've almost had two stories to their playoffs. The first was like, okay, they're getting lucky. They're getting every bounce. They're not facing starting goalies. And now all of a sudden it's like, Huh? <laughs> like no, they're that, actually good. Yeah. Oh wait, they they turn they. I'm not gonna say they turned on a switch because they've been winning, but people know what I mean. That like something hit us in the face. That like you know both things can be true. They got lucky, and they're also very good. And I guess too, considering their record and their point total, they were pretty like low key, really good all year. Like no one was really. Everyone's picking Carolina, the Leafs, Tampa, Florida, like. I don't remember everyone like being gung ho on the New York Rangers, like down the stretch or when, when they we're doing their picks in the playoffs. It's gonna be fun, man. I'm, I'm excited to see how the, the end of the series plays out. It was the analytics community, in my opinion, that was you know right putting people off the Rangers because they were getting outshot all the time. Honestly, not I, you know not every single game, but there were a lot of games they're getting outshot, outchanced, Shesterkin standing on his head. So the analytics community was like, this isn't sustainable. How can they do this through four rounds of the playoffs? But when you look at their roster, Artemi Panarin, star. Mika Zibanejad, star. Adam Fox, star. Chris Kreider, 50 goals this season. This season, he's been a star. They got a lot of talent. That's a lot Mm -hmm. more talent than a lot of other teams in the NHL. Honestly, when you look at the top of their talent group, it's pretty darn good. So I'm not surprised that they've made it this far. And another reason why I think Colorado wouldn't want to face them is because the Rangers, again, they're comfortable getting outshot and having Igor Shesterkin stand back there and make 40 saves. True. They've been doing that all season. True. So I, I think they're comfortable being in a situation where the abs are flying up and down the ice, but Shesterkin's going to make saves. And the Rangers have a lot of speed as well and a lot of star players who can go the other way and attack Colorado. So... I, yeah, I don't think it's like a an ideal matchup for Colorado. Listen, Colorado's a huge favorite right now to win the cup. It's crazy. Like they're they're like minus two ten right now to win the Stanley Cup. It's almost hmm. like these other so teams are are not. They're so not even getting a chance, so. honestly. Like just based on what the betting markets are saying right now. If if they're minus two ten, it means one of the two teams is even worse. It means like, say, I don't know, they're minus 150 against Tampa. Well, then they're minus like 260 versus the Rangers. So that's not so much credit they're giving them. The, the thing is with the Rangers, and I often say this about teams or when I'm trying to break down teams is, okay, like I'll look at the lineup and I'll say, who's dangerous? And I'll often say that even there's teams that aren't very good, but on any, on any given night, they can beat you because they have guys who are dangerous. They have guys who can score whatever, even though they are a shit team. But in the Rangers case, they're a good team. And they also have a lot of guys who are dangerous. Like you mentioned, Kreider, Panarin, Zbigniewicz. Those guys only need one shot, one chance, one turnover. They're going back the other way. Adam Fox, like one play makes an incredible pass to someone breaking in. I mean, it's weird, man, because because with the Rangers compared to other teams who have done damage surprisingly in the playoffs in previous years, they have more of those guys, in my opinion. Like you, how you touch on you touch on several times, like you don't think Carolina has the star power. The Rangers have the star power, hands down, hands down. And maybe we were like underrating them all year and their stars and how much they could carry the team. And and again, in a short series, that's all you need, some guys to step it up. But yeah, either way, man. Like think of it, like. It's going to be awesome whether we get Colorado Tampa or Colorado Rangers. That's a great Stanley Cup final. Like, we'll yeah. be lucky as hockey fans to get one of those two finals. At the end of the day, like, people can say whatever they want. In the West, it had to be Colorado. Like, really. Like, I'm kicking myself. Like, like legitimately, it was dumb not to bet the Avalanche well to win the Stanley Cup. I think they were, like, plus 250 at the start of the playoffs. But even, like, to win the, to win the West really it would have taken something like even if it had been like everyone's like oh calgary it would have taken something special from calgary to to beat the avalanche right so well because a lot of people thought if the abs were going to get clipped it was in the second round against either st louis or minnesota right that was the spot that they could lose but i don't think anyone saw them losing to edmonton losing to calgary i mean calgary had a great season and you know we were high on them 
a lot of people were high on the Calgary Flames. So maybe if it was Calgary, Colorado, you know, that would have been maybe a little bit closer just based on the style that Calgary plays. But honestly, they, they weren't losing to anyone in the Pacific Division. Yeah. You're right. I mean, it it's their year. I mean, I thought it was their year last year. I thought it was maybe even their year, the year before year that. Before. <laughs> but before you said it on the last podcast, man, these teams, they, they never win when they're like expected to win. It's always, it always happens like a year or two later, the year that you think everything's going well, this team's a juggernaut. They're going to steamroll their way to the cup. It's never that year that that team gets it done. It always takes a little bit of time. Yeah. And that's what's happened with this avalanche team. Lapore, let's talk about the Con Smythe trophy right now. Sure. Right now, Kale McCarr is the favorite to win the Con Smythe. Shocking. <laughs> at plus 180. He is unbelievable. Nathan That's McKinnon. That's even a good bet. That's even a good bet. Honestly, Kale McCarr a plus money right now. It's it's it should almost be a lock. Well, like you said, if if someone said, "Okay, bet the Avalanche to win the cup at minus was it 210 minus or McCarr for at plus 180, I take the McCarr bet. Even par, like you might, parlay you might that well. if you want. Abs sure. to win the cup, McCarr to win the Con Smythe. And it's even money or whatever it would end up being or ish. Yeah. Well, I mean who else? Who else is on that list? Then you got McKinnon, who's plus 200. I, I still think McKinnon can win the Conn Smythe. He has 11 goals in 14 playoff games, 18 points overall. He's four points behind Kale McCarr. McCarr That's what I was going to say. I think McCarr is more than him. Yeah, McCarr leads the team in scoring in the playoffs with 22 points, Yeah, which is insane for a defenseman. Uh, and then right after that, it's, it's Igor Shesterkin at 8-1. to one. To win the con smite. So those are your top three. But Kale McCarr, man, I mean, this dude is insane. Kelly Rudy said on the on the Sportsnet panel in the intermission that he got a text. I believe he said it was from a former player who said that he thought Kale McCarr is the best defenseman that we've seen since Bobby Orr. Mm, and, and I know McCarr it sounds like nervous. an extremely hot take because there have been several Hall of Famers who have played in this league since Bobby Orr retired. So to say that Kale McCarr is the best defenseman since Bobby Orr, that that's saying a lot, man. But like Paul Coffey and Nick Lidstrom and well, I was gonna say people were saying that when Carlson exploded, like those Norris trophies, putting up eighty points. Oh, he's the best offensive defenseman since Bobby Orr. And you mean touching on the Carlson thing? I'd be nervous if I was McCarr if that, if that comparison was made. But he's but unbelievable. Not, yeah, I mean, watching this guy, he 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 can do it all. Like he's obviously insanely talented offensively, but defensively, the way that he exits the zone, the way that he just, he, you know, he can you're giddy, fit. Bruno. You got a man crush or what? Oh McCarr? man, you know, you know, I love my D men because that was the position I played when I played hockey. Like I love, I'm I'm a nerd over defenseman and just the way that he moves the puck, the decisions he makes, the the oh, little skates. plays he makes in the D zone. Like he's like deflecting pucks, getting in lanes. Oh my god, he's just. He's absurd. Yeah. Honestly, he's a he's a magician out there and he's the best defenseman in the NHL. And like you said, Laporte, I mean, it, I think we should all just be betting on Kale McCarr at this point to win the con smite. Yeah, like people forget that it's like it's not the NBA where they have the finals MVP. It's not the Stanley Cup final MVP. It's the playoff MVP. So like going over those numbers, I mean, and it's it's not just about points, but the fact that you said McCarr is four more points than McKinnon. So even if McKinnon outscores him by a handful of points in the final and they win and they're about the same, I'm, I'm going with the defenseman who, who put up those numbers. So to me, that one's a no brainer. And like McCarr is not going to have a, a poor series. Well, I'll ask you this. You think McDavid gets any votes as a guy, not even in the final? There's going to be people that end up voting for Connor McDavid. Yeah, I, I can already see swept. it happening, which, which yeah. is actually insane because I don't think anyone I don't think there's ever been a player who got eliminated in the third round and got con Smythe votes. I could be wrong. Carlson did. Did you know, he twenty seven? Yeah, he was bananas in that playoff run. I remember him getting a couple. Not, I don't wow. know about first place. No, no first place votes. I don't think, but he was on the sheet. There. Okay, like, okay, F fair enough. So yeah, I mean, yeah. there's going to be people that that vote for McDavid, but man, you just that just doesn't sit well with me. You you can't be voting for a guy who didn't even make the Cup final. I, I'm all for giving the Conn Smythe to the loser in the Stanley Cup final, especially if they were like exceptional. And I know it's rare. 
Like I believe yeah, the last time it happened was J.S. Jaguar. Was mm-hmm. it not? When yeah. Anaheim it, lost in the cup final, I believe they lost to New Jersey that year. It was Jersey Jaguar. They were, that Jaguar was the, Bob, the Babcock, the Babcock ducks that like knocked out Detroit and all that went on that yeah. miracle when he stood on his head. And yeah, it's happened before. Like people forget one of the Oilers cups, uh, their second one, they gave it to Hextall. Like he was the goalie for the flyer. It's kind of funny. Like, Gretzky, maybe <laughs> you know what I mean. Like, that's I don't know if they just were. I don't know if they was trying to be cute and give wild. it to like the go- the goalie of the losing team. Glenn Hall got one for St. Louis against the Bruins, but uh, I think I think that's the bet right now, man. To get plus money on Kale McCarr, Elliot Freeman made a point during thirty two thoughts, and I'll I'll get your yes or no on this. He said he can't see a world where McCarr. I maybe wasn't putting this much of a slam dunk on it. But essentially, he said he wouldn't be surprised if Makar wins a Hart Trophy in his yeah. career. And it's tough for a defenseman to win a Hart Trophy. If you had if someone put a briefcase of a million dollars in front of you and said, if you get this question right, you get the million dollars. Is Kale Makar going to win a Hart Trophy? What would you say? It's funny you brought that up, Lepore, because I listened to the exact same 32 Thoughts podcast yesterday. God bless 32 Thoughts. I'm still waiting for them to call us and ask us if we want to be guests on the show. It's going to happen at some point. Yeah. Don't you worry. But yeah, I... I heard Elliot Friedman say that. And I paused for a second. Honestly, man, I disagree with Elliot Friedman. You can't see it. I, I, I can't see it. And I'll tell you why, because Connor McDavid is still in the NHL and Connor McDavid every year he's in his prime right now. And he's a little bit older than Kale. I believe he's older than Kale McCarr. Like McDavid's a 97. When was Kale McCarr born? Well, how many years did McCarr play in the league? Like four years in the league or something. Yeah, I think McDavid's like a year or two older. I think Let me right. check. Makar. Okay, Makar is only one year younger than Connor McDavid. Okay. So he's 23, born in 98. So it's going to take like an exceptional season. Like he's going to have to close in on like 100 points, honestly. Like he's going to have to have 90 to 100 points, phenomenal defensive numbers because McDavid every year is going to put up like 120 points. Yeah. And then obviously you have Austin Matthews, who's probably going to win the Hart Trophy this year. If Matthews has another 55 plus goal season, the Leafs yeah, he missed another- games this year too, like a 65, even God forbid, like a 70 year or something yeah, like that. Like that's still in play for Matthews. Like he could have another insane goal scoring season. And as great as Kale McCarr is, and I have a man crush on him and all of that, it's just so hard for a D man to win the Hart Trophy. Correct me if I'm wrong, Lapore. I think the last defenseman to do it was Pronger. Yeah, 2000, was it? Yeah. So 22 years ago, Chris Pronger, like that's actually kind of, I don't know. That's kind of bullshit to think it's been that long since the defenseman's won. Like we have to go over the winners and I'm I'm not saying like specifically, but just that idea that it's been 20 plus years since they named a defenseman, the best player in the league. I don't know. Especially with Nick Lidstrom being in the league. Right. Or like half of those seasons. That's it is pretty, pretty crazy to think about. But like I, you said, now, now, now that I am thinking about it, you go over the last 20 years, and it's like, well, you have, like, Crosby and Ovechkin. And it's tough. Like, it's tough for defense. There's a lot of good out. players. Like, you have yeah. to have, like, an outlier exceptional season, and he's capable of it. I just think the odds are stacked against him. Hmm. As long as, as guys like Connor McDavid are skating around and fully healthy, like, maybe it's a year where McDavid suffers an injury. Mc, even McKinnon, man. Like, McKinnon can it. still win a hard trophy. Yeah, you could get it. So yeah. yeah, that's why when 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 Friedman was like, oh, a hundred percent Makar is gonna win a hard trophy. I don't know. I'm still I, I just think the odds are stacked against him, as simple as that. It, let's make this about the Leafs because we always do. Um, am I the only and comment down below again, Leafs fans? Am I the only Leaf fan who doesn't there's par, a big part of me who that doesn't want Matthews to win the hard trophy? Why is that? We lost in the first round again. I don't want to have to listen to the bullshit of like, oh, regular season stuff, whatever. And I don't really care. Like, I've never really cared about individual awards for like the players on my teams. It would be so cool for like a least player to win the um, the Hart Trophy. But there, there's that little thing in Matthews and it'll be full panic mode in a year when he's a year away from UFA. He didn't fully commit to this team. So now he's going to the negotiation table in a year with Iva Hart Trophy. Had he signed the eight-year deal, I would have been like, hey, well, do whatever you want, win as many trophies as you want. But a big part of it, I think that still doesn't sit the greatest with me, that he signed for five years, not eight. 
I don't know. And again, we lost in the first, it, it's, it's, it's the compilation of things. It's that we lost in the first round again. Not that he was bad in the playoffs, but just to get reminded of like, we had this guy who scored 60 goals, won a hard trophy and we got ousted. And then the other idea of like, he's a UFA in two years. So I don't know. I don't know if I want to see it. And I, I know that may sound kind of weird. It may have come out kind of weird, but I don't know. No, I'll, I'll tell I hear you what, you, man. I'll tell you, if he if he signs on July one of next year, he can go and score hundred goals, win the hard trophy. I'll give him a pat on the back and be very happy for Austin. I hear you, man. I I don't think you're alone. Now I I completely disagree with you. Like I would love to see Austin Matthews win the hard trophy. I think it's going to be great. And again, it, it's not the greatest look because the Leafs went out in the first round again and blew a three two series lead to Tampa. And then you have Matthews getting his rocket Richard, getting the Hart Trophy, probably getting the, uh, what do they call it now? The Ted Lindsay Award. The Lindsay. Yeah, I'm still calling it the Pearson. Player. Yeah. He's going to, you know, he's going to rack up all these awards and and once again, doesn't have a playoff series victory. So it, it doesn't look the best, but I really do hope he, he wins the trophy. I think he deserves it. Even though Connor McDavid is the best player on the planet this season specifically, Matthews had a better regular season. Disagree with me if you want. But I, I, I really hope he gets that. But Lepore, I, I don't think you're alone, man. I is don't it, think you're alone. I'll throw this out there. I know we're, I guess, again, like different personalities, different characters, how they go into situations. Does a heart, does a heart trophy help the Leafs at all? Now I'm going back on what I said. Like, can the Leafs say you want a heart trophy because you were here? Or is a player like, fuck you, I want it because I'm me, <laughs> like completely. You know what? I think Austin Matthews is smart enough to know that Mitch Marner played a big role in him winning that hard trophy. And again, I yeah. think Austin Matthews can put up 40 goals playing with me and you on his wing. Honestly, like I, 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 I well almost believe his first that. Two years. <laughs> yeah. But I think playing with Mitch Marner just takes him to that next level from a production standpoint. It's almost like dry sidle, right? Like, and I get it. I know this year, like McDavid and Drysaddle didn't play together as often as they have done in the past. But don't tell me for one second that if McDavid or that if Drysaddle was playing by himself, he would have the same production. Even beyond playing with the player, I think player forget people forget about even like the focus or how like if you're on the second line now, stuff like that, you get better matchups for yourself. Like it, it helps all around. Like it's not a coincidence that like most times when you look at the the scoring leaders at the end of the season, you see two guys from one team who are very close together at the top. Always. It's not like Backstrom and Ovechkin, Marner and Matthews, McDavid and Dreisaitl. Crosby and Malkin. Yeah, like they help each other, man. Like, and teams know that. But, yeah. So I think Matthews is smart enough to know, like, how good he has it with Marner. And again, maybe he can go find another playmaker in another situation, and it works out just as well. But I think Matthews knows what he has here. Now, does that mean he's not going to ask for the sky, the moon, and the stars? No, he's probably going to ask for the biggest contract in the NHL. Mm-hmm. Like, I, w- I would imagine he's going to be asking for, like, 12 to $13 million a year on his next deal. Oh, I think we'd be lucky if it was 12 to 13. If it's oh, under 13. More, eh? Oh, yeah, bro. Dude, think of it. McDavid will be how many years removed from his 12.5? That's a good and point. And when he... And when Matthew signed that deal, he was a 40 goal scorer. Now he's a 60 goal scorer. We'll have to see what McKinnon gets as well when he hits UFA, because that'll hit- that'll play a factor as well. Like if McKinnon's getting 13 million, right? And you yeah. know, you could argue Matthews isn't as good as McDavid and McKinnon. Like you could say those are the only two players in the league who are better than Austin Matthews. But yeah, I mean coming off a 60 goal season who knows what he's going to do next year and again what if he has a hard trophy i'm better than both of them he's, he's gonna yeah. say bruno the other thing too to touch on is that my assumption is that he really likes keith as well i don't know if you saw a thing on twitter where arash madani from sportsnet said that the leafs should go after uh rick bonus right after he left dallas and it was matthew's agent who said like you're ridiculous like he's a good coach and he's done a great job So like to your point about how Marner helped Matthew Sue, like some acknowledgement of like, I'm also doing really well because I play for a coach who uses me the way I want. And again, we we, we turned this uh, conference finals uh, podcast with the Rangers, Lightning, uh, Oilers, and Avalanche into 
uh, the Austin Matthews uh, contract extension. So this is the most Toronto Maple Leafs thing ever. It always comes back to the Leafs, man. Always yeah. comes back. To Why the do Leafs. other fan bases uh, hate us and hate the media and all that stuff? I can't figure it out. Oh, I absolutely love it. Before, before we wrap this thing up, are the Avalanche going to win the cup no matter what? I told you last week they were going to win the Stanley Cup. It was two weeks ago, last week. So the Avalanche are going to win the Stanley Cup, man. I think I'm making that Kale McCarr bet. I really am. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to do it too. I, I was right there with you. We both said on last week's show that the Avalanche were going to win the Stanley Cup, and I don't think there's any reason to stray away from that at this point, whether it's Tampa, whether it's the Rangers. The Avs are going to be a favorite. They're going to be a pretty sizable favorite as well. Um, you know, not having Nazem Kadri, that stings. Mm. And that just sucks. It even sucks. Fan, even for Leafs fans, like that sucks. You want to you want to see Nas out there. He was he was he had such a good regular season. He was having such a good playoffs, and now he's most likely not going to be a part of this Cup final. It's just yeah. so unfortunate. I know, man. Brutal. Absolutely brutal. Lepore, is there anything else you want to get off your chest before we wrap up this podcast? Nothing really to get off my chest. I'm just stoked to watch the end of this conference final, man. Because it's not too often. Like again, you asked me last week who's going to win the cup. A big part of me quickly saying Colorado is because I gave. I'll, if I'm being perfectly honest, I gave Edmonton no chance to beat Colorado, and then I like Colorado against the two teams they're playing. That against the two options they have for their opponent in the final. But it's not too often I look at a series and. I have no prediction. Like I, I legitimately, if the Rangers win this series in five, I won't be surprised. If Tampa comes back and wins this series, I will not be surprised. It's not too often. So like, I'm really excited to be a neutral on this one. Yeah, this series, I think we're in for an awesome finish because there's also the Braden Point situation. Like he was Still. on the ice skating with them, I believe like yesterday. Mm. And he's not going to play in game four, but you know, if this thing gets the game six or seven, he could be back potentially. So that'll be an interesting wrinkle if he comes back into this series. But yeah, I, honestly, at this point, I wouldn't be surprised either way if it's the Rangers or the Lightning who find a way to win this series. And it, like you said, the Stanley Cup final, it's going to be unreal no matter what, whether it's Avalanche, Lightning, Avalanche, Rangers, some great storylines, some star players. It's going to be awesome. Sticking with the injuries, no word on Kemper yet, eh? Yeah, like Kemper, so he backed up uh, Franco's in game four. But yeah, like, is he 100%? I mean, I, I'm assuming he's fine since he, he backed up Franco's. But if you think he was healthy enough to back up and he's going to get, he's going to get a rest now. I mean, you'd think he'd be ready to go. I mean, I'm not a doctor. Yeah, and I, I think he's going to be but fine. Like, I think they're going to go big. with Kemper in game one of the cup final. But yeah. honestly, man, there's probably going to be a short leash. Because yeah. Kemper wasn't very good in the first three rounds before his injury. Even Fran and, and Fran Sos, for that matter, like there was some questionable goals he let in in this series against Edmonton. Both of them have had like okay playoffs. So I think there's there's gonna be a short leash on Kemper in the cup final. But no matter what, I think they're both like capable enough goalies to to win a Stanley Cup for Colorado. Yeah, imagine being that good that like you have this big issue in goal and it's like, yeah, I still think we can do it. It's just, it's just sickening to see how good this team is. Yeah, I saw a guy, I wish we'll, and we'll end it. I saw a guy walking through a store the other day and uh, he had like a player tee on the Avalanche logo on the front, McKinnon on the back. And I had to stop him and I was just like, what's it like? <laughs> like, like, he looks at me, I'm like, I I'm a Lee fan. Like, how does it feel? to legitimately be like super confident in your team all the time. And he, he laughed. I'm like, no, I'm it's a serious question, bro. I'm asking what it feels like. Cause I've never felt that way. But yeah, if I was a Colorado fan, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be pretty strong right now. I'd be having some good workouts cause I'd be in a good happy mood. Yeah. If you're a Colorado fan at this point, it, it almost feels like a formality. It's like, all right, they're winning the Stanley cup, but how many games is it going to take? Just like, don't blow it. They're just such yeah, exactly. Just, just don't, don't blow it, please. Yeah. Like, don't pull a Leafs here. Yeah. Just just finish the job because this team has been so good for the last, like, three years. It's their time, man. I'll, I'll be shocked, honestly, if they don't, Me too. they don't win the cup. But Me too. that is going to do it for episode 63 of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast or GFP. 
a Toronto Maple Leafs and NHL podcast hosted by Michael Lapore and Anthony Bruno. Once again, if you really enjoyed this episode, please give us a five-star rating on, and review on both Apple and Spotify. We would love you for that. And if you're watching us on YouTube, you have no idea how much this helps us out. If you just smash that like button and subscribe to the channel. And then while you're at it, ring the notification bell so you know exactly when the GFP podcast is posting some new content. So for Michael Lapore, I'm Anthony Bruno, and we will see you in the next one. Thanks so much, everyone. Oh,